<laughs> you know, you know, I, I have something I got to tell you because th- 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 something happened to me and my wife that, you know, the word of God, once you pray those Ephesians prayers, what happens is, is it actually happens. You start getting revelation. <laughs> Your eyes start getting open. And what happens is, is that you, you've been taught to do certain things. And you get into, uh, uh, you know, a mode every day, and you do the same things. But what happens is, is all of a sudden, when the Spirit of God, can you imagine that, comes in, and he, he comes and takes, takes hold of you in your weakness, and he starts to give you strength in an area, then it lights up. And then all of a sudden, it's not just a thing you do every day. It's a living thing. And that's what will happen to you all from now on. Because I didn't come back here for myself, and I didn't come back here for nothing to happen. You know, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be speaking over the word of God, the seed that was sown in your hearts from now on. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm to, I'm going to place a demand on heaven that that seed is going to sprout. Okay, so what happens is in different areas of your life where you don't have enlightenment, you know, then the spirit of God wants to come in because that's a weakness. If you're not, if you are not anointed in a certain area to see, then you're in weakness. Did you know that? But you don't know it. So those of you who are depressed right now, it's a chemical thing in your body. It's real. But the origin of that depression has to do with something else. You see, a thought can generate the excretion of chemicals in your brain and in your body. See, your body just follows suit from what you think. Now, I'll tell you how. When I was little and I was going to grade school, when I had that visitation at 10 years old, something happened to me. Now, I didn't get saved till I was 19. So see, I was in weakness because I had a visitation. I was taken somewhere and shown my future for 21 years, for three sevens, three seven-year sections, and they all happened just like I saw it. But I didn't get saved until I was 19, but this happened at 10. So I didn't have understanding, but the Lord, I would feel a presence beside me at times, and I would get all hot and I would feel this, this warmth, like a blanket. And one time it happened in front of my sisters, my three sisters and my brother. And um, I, was, I was saved from getting struck by a car. And I, I, didn't, I felt like something stood between us and bounced the car away from me. So when I, when, after I walked in, I told my brothers and sisters, now I'm not even saved. This is a, this is a 16. And they said, what just happened? And I said, well, this guy, you know, and I told him the whole story. As I'm telling him, that, that presence came, stood beside me, and then wrapped, and then wrapped around all of them. They started crying. Now, listen to me. My sisters fell to their knees and started crying. They said, you look so beautiful. You don't look, you don't look the same. You're glowing. And what happened was my face started to transfigure because of what was happening to me on the, on the, in the realm around me. Now, I wasn't even saved. So in your weakness, the spirit needs to come in. So it's okay to be weak. As long as you're yielding to the spirit in the process of that. So if you're suffering from depression, you have to understand that you, you can grab a hold of that control with your thoughts, and you can make, now your body, it, it, does not, it does not care about you. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you. Last night while you were sleeping, you know, you, your spirit's on fire, born again. Last night while you were sleeping, your mind and your body were having meetings without you, and they voted you off the island. <laughs> They're working against you. I'm telling you, they're meeting without you. Your mind and your body are going to work against you. And unless you, Paul said, I beat my body daily in order that after I preach Christ, that I myself am not considered a castaway or completely pushed out of the race. That's the apostle Paul. He's a big boy. He's an apostle. Now he said, if I don't discipline my body, and, the, and if you do the word study, beat my body black and blue, discipline it, so that after he had preached Christ, been faithful, he would be disqualified 
Because he let his body rule him. Okay? Now listen to me. He also said in Romans 12 too, he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind by the word of God. So your, your, your soul is not saved. Your spirit is saved. It's two different words. Suke and spirit, and spirit, pneuma. So your mind, will, and emotions, you have to, in your spirit, you have to live out of your spirit. Now, it says this, the sons of God are those who live by the Spirit of God, who walk in the Spirit. Those who are walking in the Spirit, Romans 8, 3, 8, 4, it talks about that. Paul, the whole chapter, 8th chapter of Romans. So, as I was saying, I live in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 through 23. Those are the prayers I pray. And then I pray them for others. And then I spend my day praying for others. Now, what happens is, because I don't take up my own case, I let the Spirit take up my case and do what he needs to do. He needs to intercede for people all day. I, I get covered. I, and I, I really literally, if you were to ask me, anyone, if you just stand here, what, what, is there anything you, I'll do anything you want me to do. What do you want? Do you need anything? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? I could not tell you a thing. I, I, really, I mean, and Kathy knows this. She asked me. Do you want anything for your birthday? And I said, no. In fact, there's years where we take, we take what we were spend with each other and we, we, we give it on a, a family in our church. There's a family that has six kids. We just give the whole thing over there to them. So this is doable. I'm not a super apostle. My name's Kevin and I speak in tongues. And that's Kathy. She's a hairdresser. Okay, do you get it? Okay, so it's... I just, I want to share this with you. We decided, you know, when we got married, I, we were making 3000 a month between the two of us. And I, and I said, Kathy, this is the, my, my, my job. I work so much, but it's like we still can't. It's, it's just like we're so tight. And I said, we're tithing. We're doing everything. I said, you know what? The Spirit's telling me. Now, listen to me. He's telling me we should tithe off of what we need to operate under so we have money to give. And that was 6000 a month. Okay, this is what happened. So we started tithing off of 6000 And you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> For three years. It took everything to make that tithe into that basket every week. But we did it. And you know what happened? You can look it up on the books. Southwest Airlines, our, our contract came up. It was open for two years, and they could not resolve it with us. So we were walking at midnight. So I got the notification, don't show up for work the next day. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not working anyway. Thank God. I don't even be a part of this. I'm just happy to have a job. But, you know, I, you know that's what the union said. So anyway, at 12.01, the, the president of the company said, these, these flight attendants, they spend 85% of the time with the customer. Everyone else spends almost nothing with the customer. So we're going to give them what they want. Well, what, what I ended up getting was 6000 a month. <laughs> now, are you hearing me? It was actually more than that. It was 110% raise. Okay, I got to add something else. Do you, do you mind? I don't like talking about my money, but I got to tell you something. I am not doing this for any ulterior motive than I want you to prosper and be in good health. I want you to have everything that Jesus has for you. But part of that is, is you got to let him into parts of your life where you don't have the anointing on you to understand. So what happened was when I retired, the Lord gave me a person's name. So I looked it up on Facebook, and he was a financial advisor. So I thought, well, that must be the spirit. So I, I contacted him on Facebook, and then um, I talked to him on the phone. I've never met him to this day. He said, how did you find out about me? And I said, well, the Lord gave me your name. I looked you up on Facebook, and here I am. I said, um, I'm about ready to retire. He said, okay. He said, he said how much is it? And I told him, he said, how did you get that much? I said, well, you know, I'm giving tithing. He's a, you know, he's, he's a very spiritual man himself, but he handles billions, not millions, billions. Can you listen to me? He gets the figures and he says, you know what? He says, I've never seen anything like this. How old are you? I said, 56. He said, okay. 
He said, you get 6000 a month for the rest of your life. Well, I, I, I mean, when I just said it, I had to tell myself to breathe because it still hits me. i like, you know what? And all those doubts and fears I had, you know, it's like I'm embarrassed. But I'm just telling you that. Really consider letting the Holy Spirit talk to you about these things because... I'm going to go a step further, and forgive me if I've gone too far, but um, there was a person that did not like us at all, and he, he, it was bad. And the Lord said, give him $50,000. I said, that's a whole year's salary. So I went to Kathy, and I thought, well, I said, Lord, you tell her. And I knew, I knew, I thought, I thought, well, you know, this ain't... She ain't going to hear $50,000 because you know how much shopping money that is. Or what? No. You know, like, anyway, she's on the treadmill. She said, okay, I'll pray. I said, you know, I feel like we're supposed to give some money to this person and um, just to minister to them and, and love on them because God has a plan for their life. And they really need, they really need to, to, to come in line with what God has for him. And so she came back to me. She said, the Lord said $50,000. I said, oh. So we gave it to them. And now he really likes us a lot, you know. <laughs> and, and we're like a man of God, you know. Like, well, you hear from God, you know. No, the, the thing was it restored him. He just texted me. He, he just texted me two weeks ago. He said, Kevin, just keep doing what you're doing in the world. He says, you are really touching people, just like what my dad said to me before he died. But I passed my, we passed our test. So you, you don't even want to know what has happened since then. And it's, we didn't give to get. <laughs> we gave out obedience to the word of God because love God. So anyway, that's enough about that. But the Holy Spirit is really speaking some things to me. And it's about depression. It's about the, the fact that, that the, the, Lord, the Lord wants you to know that there are spiritual entities that will influence you with feelings and also manifest in your body things that are real. To you they are really physically happening now most people couldn't imagine me being depressed but if you will listen to me I had so many miracles happen to me since I've come back things that I can't do myself and that's what I like about it I like I like being in a low position to where I need help all the time I constantly need help you, you know, what you don't know about me is I have wore out a path in my backyard for hours just saying, Lord, have mercy on me. So just so you know, I mean, it's not about me. It's about Jesus, but I know it. But see, I want you to get there really quickly, and I don't want you to be all bruised up and cut up. You know, I want you to just do the fast button, the easy button, and just hit it, the app, and go right to it. You can do that, you know. I can, save, I can save you by testifying of the faithfulness of God to you. Okay, so here, here's the thing. In your weakness, Romans 8.26 says, in your weakness, the Spirit will come in and take hold of you. Now, it doesn't say in your strength. It says in your weakness. So there has to be a, a, a bit of humility and sober-mindedness, like Titus was told by Paul Titus 2.6 says, be sober-minded. There is this process of humility and brokenness. Now, depression is, is the false demonic. People think that feeling bad and depressed is being humble. And it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fabrication being depressed is not being humble, and God's not humbling you. Depression is an attack, and it's a spirit that comes to attack you. Now, when I first started the job, I didn't want my job. I was there for 29 years, and I let the Lord know every day I didn't want that job. Because think about this, a $100 million airplane, I walk in and I don't go to the left and sit in the driver's seat. I turn to the right and go back to flight attendants complain all day and passengers complain all day. And I'm like, 
I agree with you. I don't even want to be here either. But, you know, while we're here, let's just make it good. They're paying us to be happy and to treat people nice. You know, if you, like, treat people nice, you're going to be a superstar because nobody's doing that, you know? <laughs> I mean, they think you're like, I mean, did, I got, I was at 530 in the morning. I was, I was, I had a letter come to the company complaining that I was smiling too much because it was an early flight. And the passenger was mad at me. He said, will you tell him to quit smiling? I go, you want me to be mean like every other flight attendant is to you? I don't know. What do you want? I thought you paid to be happy. You know, anyway, there, there, so I, I made it. Yeah. No. Well, it was on the East Coast. Yeah, it was. But see, I grew up on the East Coast, so I, I know my peeps, you know. I know. I know what I'm dealing with, you know. I, anyway, dear Lord. So the spirit comes in in your weakness, okay? So think about this. I didn't want the job. So I, I get the interview, and I didn't even want to get the interview. So I get the interview, and I find out that there's 33 positions. They got three airplanes, and there's 33 positions. They need 11 flight attendants um, for three airplanes because they fly 16 hours a day. And so they need, that's how much they need for each airplane. Even though there's only three flight attendants on an aircraft, they, they, you know, it just keeps going. It works more than we do, the airplane. So I show up at this, you know, imagine this. I don't even want to do this. And I show up. There's 750 Barbie dolls being interviewed and me. <laughs> and I got, I, got the, I got the second interview. And I didn't even want it. So I show, I'm like, how did I just do this? So I show up in the second interview, and there's two people now instead of a panel. Now, they chose 125 out of the 750, and then they, they, they're going to choose 33 out of the 125. So I go in there and sit there, and they just stare at me. And I'm thinking, oh, good, this is going to be easy. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm so glad I'm not going to get this job. And they started laughing at me. And they said, well, you already got the job, but we got to sit here and pretend like we're interviewing you. I go, what? I already got the job? Oh, no. Are you sure? So he said, yeah, but not everyone's going to get chosen. They're all out there waiting. So we got to wait here 11 minutes. And so what do you want to talk about? So I just made them laugh, and then, we, you know, we left, and, then, and I got the job. Okay, so I'm flying, and I'm being drained. And this, this woman, she's, I, I don't know how to describe her, I, 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 so I won't. <laughs> but she was the most wonderful person that I had met up to that time. I hadn't even met my wife yet. But she was like, I felt, you know, like, like when I met Jesus later on, a couple years later, four years later, she reminded me of him. Just like my CEO of my company, he, he, he was so gracious and loving to me that I felt, I felt like Jesus uh, was there, even though he started drinking at 10 in the morning. You know, the, my, my CEO, not Jesus. Anyway, I'm flying with this. I'm, I'm flying with this girl, and she's so gracious. And I mean, she's such a, a lady. I mean, just classy lady, very kind. And there's nothing wrong with her. The not thing, even every curl in her hair is perfect. But she doesn't even like draw attention to herself. She just like talking about me, asking me questions. I never. So I said, well, she said, Kevin, what are you even doing this job for? You know, like you don't seem like the person that would even do this. And I go, don't get me started. But I, she said, you just is this just something you're going to do per, uh, just for, a, uh, you know, a couple years? And I said, yeah. And she said, me too. She said, um, I have to end my career because I, I'm getting pregnant. That's all she said. So be, then I'm going to be just have a family. So my career's done once I start having children. I didn't ask her to think, because if you know me, I don't ask any questions unless you offer information. I don't, I don't get into people's business at all. I only let them feel free what they, they want to share with me. So she didn't share anything else. She just said that my husband and I agreed that I could do this. I'm just going to do this for a year, and then I'm going to have a child. We're going to start having children. So I just wanted to do this because it's, it's a dream of mine. I go, well, that's not mine, so it's good for you. Okay, are you ready for this? I said goodbye to her, and she just hugged me, and I just felt such love coming from her. But I didn't know she was a Christian. I didn't know nothing. I hadn't had my experience going to heaven yet. Are you ready for this? You know how 
we used to have magazines on the aircraft. She was on the front cover of Cosmopolitan. Did you hear me? She never brought attention to herself. She never mentioned that. So I showed it to the other girls. She go, oh, yeah, did you fly with her? I go, yeah. She didn't even say anything about it. And it touched my life. Are you hearing me? Yeah. It touched my life. Because that's the way Jesus is. You know, I stood before him for 45 minutes, and he, he, he spoke the universes into existence because everything that was made, it says in John, everything that was made was, was made through him. He framed the worlds with his words according to um, the Bible. <laughs> Romans, Romans and Hebrews. Listen. After a while of listening to him speak to me, and he's talking about what we and him are going to do together after I come back to be with him. And I looked down, and I had this beautiful robe on. It was an oriental robe the whole way to, the, to, to my ankles with those really cool buttons that buttoned down the whole way, real high collar. And I had rank on me. I don't, I don't know how many stripes I had on my, sh my arm, but I'm, I'm, you know, because my dad was military and because I'm around military friends, I knew that it had to be something very special. And then I looked and I had patches that were different countries and different territories that I was over. I was assigned to watch over them with a bunch of angels. You hearing me? Yeah. And then I looked at him again and I looked into his eyes and I said, does he not know that I have not done everything that I should have done. And he said to me, he says, oh, you're not down here surviving, Kevin. You're down here qualifying for your position with me in the next life. Is everybody listening to me? Okay, because you can see how depression can leave. Like, I just felt it leave the room myself. So I can imagine what you all feel like. I realized that every one of us is important. But see, Jesus is even more important, but he doesn't even push that on you. Now listen to me. <laughs> because there's going to have to be a whole refurbishment of the way that we do things. It's going to have to be a redoing of who we think we are versus who we really are in a lot of ways, okay? Okay. Now listen to me. Jesus said, I didn't come on my own. He said, the words I speak, they're not mine. He said, I don't speak on my own accord. Can you imagine that? The son of God that blew, he breathed. He said, I don't speak on my own accord. I only speak with the father. And when he was in the garden, he said, Lord, he said, if you can, he said, father, if you can just make this cup pass from me, do it, but not my will. Did you hear? The son of God said, not my will, but thine be done. Okay, then he said, okay, what we're talking about this morning, about the spirit, the, 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 the comforter, he said, another one's going to come like me, but he is not going to speak on his own accord. He's going to speak what the father says. Did you hear me? When Jesus did something, he said, I only do what I see my father doing. So all the works, they were the father's works through him. Okay, why do you think Jesus did that? If he was the son of God and he had all authority, why did he do that? It was for us. It was to show that you need to allow weakness to come forth so that you can find strength. Paul said, I glory in my weakness. I'm excited when I'm weak because then the power of God is revealed. Now, I'm just being honest with you. I don't think I've ever shared this before, but I just want you to know that I ride on the crest of that wave of weakness all the time. This morning before I came here, before I got picked up, I, w I was weak. And I said, Lord, I said, I said, have mercy on me so that the people will hear your words this morning because your words are life. Your words are spirit. And I've just come to speak your heart just like that lady. She was more concerned about my comfort than her career. She was a supermodel, not just a model, a supermodel. 
And she was just doing this because it was something in her heart. But once you have children, you're done. So she wanted to do this flight attendant job. Now, see, to her, that was her dream. To me, it was an inconvenience. Are you all hearing me? So what's inconvenient to you might be someone else's dream. So Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory. Okay, but that glory, I've been there. In fact, I'm fixing to have another dose right now because I need that glory. I need to see his face. I need to smell his breath and take it in. His breath is life. When he, you know, when he would go to funerals, he would ruin them. And I remember right after I got off probation at the job, I got a call button in the middle of the cabin, right at the overwing window exit. And this guy had been dead for minutes. He had, he had been sleeping, but he was completely, no blood. It was like all gray. He was gray, a corpse like you'd see in, at a funeral. And she said, something's wrong with my husband. I go, oh, yes. I go, so when did this happen, you know? Dear Lord. So I'm thinking, well, you know, if we can get blood flowing and I'll do CPR, we can at least get help the body. If it, if it kicks in, it kicks in. So it's weird, you know. I, I've been to the, the, the biggest most most powerful word of faith school you can go to and now I'm reduced to a flight attendant and I'm depressed and now this guy is dead and his wife starts weeping because there's no pulse I had to yell out no pulse no breathing which means initiate CPR go get the equipment call the med, med link phone get a, somebody a doctor to help us if we need to um, you know we can give them other stuff if we get permission to you know with syringes and all that stuff and, um, but I have to have permission. I have to have, to have a doctor there on the phone. So I'm waiting for all of that. And she just starts sobbing. And you, I'm telling you, I can still hear that sob from the depths of losing her husband that she loved. And I saw the glory of God on her. And I said, are you a Christian? And she said, yeah, and he is too. And I said, can I pray over him? Now I'm thinking, Lord, just receive him into your arms now. You know, that, a funeral, I'm serious. Now, what has happened to me in just a few months? I've been reduced because I'm depressed, because I'm not doing my dream. But my dream is right before me, but I just don't know it. Now, listen to me. In my weakness, I went to say, Lord, just receive him into your arms. And out of my mouth, the Spirit said, come back in the name of Jesus. And he woke up. And you know what's so embarrassing about it? I was surprised. See, the Holy Spirit, in my weakness, interrupted my depression. And, and in my weakness, he made me strong. And I became a man of God instead of a funeral director. Are you all hearing me? I, this is the message for this morning. Is the power of God is always present. Jesus, I mean, how can I mess this up? He's right here. And he tells me, the power of God is always present to heal. The power of God is always present at any one moment. He's always available. But we don't tap into it. We have to yield to it. But it's a spiritual thing, right? Spirit to spirit, Jesus said. So the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing, right? That's what Jesus said in the garden. Okay, so think about this. Think about what I'm saying. Right now, there's other things in my body that every morning I say, I say I'm healed in Jesus' name. You know, I used to do 20-mile runs. And I wore out all the cartilage in my left knee. So now, at times, I limp. Well, that's not God's will. But, you know, I ran it off. I would do 60-mile weeks. Like nothing. I would laugh the first mile of my 20-mile runs. I would laugh. This is nothing. And now I can't run at all. So every morning when I wake up, I go, I got cartilage in my knee. Being in that radar environment for 29 years, my thyroid doesn't work right, so I have to take medicine, but I take my healing every morning. I say, I, I mean, every morning my wife hears me, I take, go in that bottle and I go, taking my healing, because I'm healed in Jesus' name. You healed my kidneys, you healed my liver, you healed my heart, my hair's coming back. 
You can do this. You can do this because at any one moment, Jesus said, power is available. Now, Jesus went to a house. And Jesus was there, it says, and the power to heal was also present. Two different things. Just like John the Baptist said, the one who's coming after me is going to baptize you in fire as well as the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit and fire. See how we are? For every mile of highway, there's two miles of ditches because there's one on each side. So we get on in one ditch, we get out, we go a little bit more, and we get on the other side. We're in a ditch. And you're like, wow, this road is rough. No, that's a ditch. <laughs> so listen to me. When the Spirit starts to move, you got to move with them. Now, I'm going to tell you something that's going to flip you out. But where I was, I was, I walked into this room. Jesus took me there. So it's his fault. But... I couldn't see the floor, I couldn't see the ceiling, couldn't see the wall. There was, this room had no, no uh, furniture or paintings. It was the glory of God. And I never, I mean, I've been to the throne. I've sat beside Jesus on a throne. And don't worry about it, it's in Revelation. In the, in the second chapter, it says that he who overcomes will also sit with me on a throne. So get over it. We're seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. So get over it. We sit, we're seated with him. So I was sitting with him on a throne beside Jesus. He's right there. And I didn't even want to be there. I said, what am I doing here? I want to go down and worship because all these people were worshiping. And so I tried to sneak off because Jesus was basking in the worship and the father wasn't. So I went like, I'm going to see the father. So I went like this and Jesus body blocked me. He said, you can't see the face of the father. Your body won't take you back. You, once you see him, you, you won't live in your body any longer. Your body's fallen. It won't accept your spirit back. It'll melt. I said, whoa, okay, all right. (laughs) So I try to sneak off and sneak down there. I just wanted to get there. There was angels right at the front that were face down. I just wanted to get in the front row there and worship God. I thought, what am I doing here besides Jesus? Because it felt, you know what I'm talking about. It felt like they were worshiping me, that they weren't. They were worshiping the Father and the Son. But I was seated with him according to Scripture, and I was there. And Jesus said, no. Because I put my, I went like this, and I got my right toe down on that beautiful whatever it was down there. It was beautiful marble or something, and um, I was going to sneak off. He says, "No," he said, "I bought this place for you. This is your place. This is yours." Okay. Now listen to me. He said, "You. This is what prayer is. You come here and you sit here during prayer." And you wait here with me until you get your answer, and then you take it back with you. I said, whoa. Did you just hear it? I have to, you, y'all, 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 y'all get it? That's what he told me. He said, because there is no questions at the throne, only answers. So do you understand now why I don't pray my, for myself? What I do is I meditate on the word of God and I go there and sit with him. And then the spirit starts talking to me. Going down the list of things, this is what you do with this. You need to not invest in that anymore. I want you to invest in this. Buy this for your wife. That church, book, book that church that asked you. This, I go, that one? Yeah. Oh, by the way, you're going to Australia. Okay. Just like that. That's my prayer time. It's a spirit of revelation and the knowledge of him. Is this too much for you all? We can talk about Noah's Ark and the animals, and the, the fuzzy animals. <laughs> because I'm telling you what. I have to unleash this because, see, I, I only have two more years to, to get around the world as much as I can. That's why I pray that the Lord open up every possible venue for me to speak. It's not for me. It's because people need to know that the Scripture is actually true. Can you imagine it's come to that? Jesus said, listen, listen. He said, listen, if you love me passionately to the point where you obey me. <laughs> 
you can ask what you will. He said, if you, my word abides in you, and you, you know, and you abide in me, you can ask what you will. And even in the Greek, <laughs> the Greek, the Hebrew, the homebrew, it's still whatever you desire, not what you need. <laughs> okay, we probably should stop now. Yeah, because see, I'm telling you, the thing, the thing about it is that you don't have time to be depressed because there's glory going on at the throne. And there, there, are, there are angels that have seen your father, and then they come and visit you. And they're trying to figure out, well, okay, why did all this be, was done for these humans, and they're depressed? Because we were just at the throne, and it's happening up there. Now, like right now, just, just so you know, that river of life, Oh, boy. I knew. I, I wasn't allowed to do it, but I knew if I went down there and got a, a espresso-sized cup of that, that I would live a 1,000 years, and the doctors couldn't even kill me. I mean, I could, I, I'm serious. I would, I would, that water was liquid diamonds. It was, it was glistening so much that it looked like I was looking into a diamond, but it was liquid. Now, listen to me. So I looked up. Silly me. I was looking for the sun because I thought, with that kind of light coming off of it, you know, the sun must be right up above me. And there was none. It was just all beautiful blue. And there was no sun because God lights up heaven. <laughs> He's the light. And I thought that, and then the Spirit said to me, that river is flowing up from within you and out of you. So right now, as I'm speaking, you know, if you notice, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about him. So I'm yielded to the things of heaven, and I'm talking to you. That's ministry. Jesus told me, and the Holy Spirit, I was in South Africa. Now listen to me very closely. Herb Kelher, the, the president of Southwest Airlines, he never talked about himself. He talked about you when he was around you. He remembered your name. He had thousands of employees. And after he's done talking to you, he, you'd look out the window of the airplane as they're loading up, and he'd be down there throwing bags with the, with the baggage handlers, talking to them. So I was in South Africa, and I said I twice in a row. You, everyone thinks big deal. Uh-uh, not with me. The Holy Spirit said to me audibly. No, I got, that's 31,000 people in that congregation. The Holy Spirit says, you say I one more time, and I'm going over there and wait until you're done talking about yourself. That's what he said. You see what I'm saying about riding that crest to that wave of weakness? If you want to experience continual power of God, continual miracles, I can give you the fast button, the easy button. You have to get over yourself. My biggest wake-up call was when I found out I wasn't coming, I wasn't, I wasn't going into the city. I was coming back here. And I looked at Jesus, and I would have liked to have seen a snapshot of my face when I realized that I was not going to meet David, King David, and Enoch, and all those people that was coming back here. You know what I said to him? I gave him the five good reasons why I'm not coming back. And you know what they were? They all had to do with the demonic on, in this realm. Because, see, he showed me everything. He spoiled me by showing me everything from the beginning. I, know, I, I was shown everything up until now. And I go, there is no way I'm going back to that. It's, it's like a haunted house. I'm serious. It's so dirty down here. Once you get to the throne, you never want to leave it so clean. And, 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 and you, it's perfect love. There's no fear. There's no, there's no doubt. You can't doubt. You try to doubt, you can't. It's not in you. And he just looked at me and smiled. And this is what he said. He said, oh, it's not about you, Kevin. Did you hear me? It's not about you. It's about all the people I'm sending you back to that need to hear what you're going to tell them because you're going to reroute people's lives. They will never, ever be the same again. Amen. 
And he said, plus, it's all extra credit if you go back because you've already finished your race. That's what he told me. And he said, listen to me. Uh, he said, if you go back, you cannot fail. I'm just being honest with you. Don't be mad. He said, you cannot fail. Now, I have never heard that before. I've never heard that before up to that point. Okay? Now, listen to me. Because you don't know how much longer I'm going to do this. I already have an exit plan. You know, I'm serious. I've already talked to the Lord. I'm just being honest with you. I've talked to the Lord. I just want to disappear. I, I really just want to go. I mean, I'll just finish what I'm going to do. And then I'm, I'm, it's just going to be like the Welsh revival. It's just going to disappear. I mean, it's going to disappear. Evan Roberts, he just like. Because I really don't care about your opinion. I care about eternal truth that I know that you need to know and you need to take your medicine even if you don't want to and what it is is that it's all about him it's not about you you were bought with a price so now you live by faith in the son of God it, you actually listen your body is not your own anymore it's a temple of the Holy Spirit I'm quoting scripture by the way it's come to that <laughs> which if your life is not your own then it means that everything about you is not your own. So while you're not, while the reason why you're not experiencing an environment in heaven all the time is because you haven't given that environment over. You're in, it's your environment. So it's cluttered with all kinds of stuff, which brings me back to the whole thing with depression. You can pray, 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 pray in the spirit. We did it one morning. I mean, think about this. I told my wife years ago, while we were watching TV, I said, someday I'm going to write a book about this experience and I'm going to be on TBN. And I said, I want that Jesse DePlanis to interview me because he's been to heaven and everything he says, I, I, I know it's there. He, he's like truly a man that actually went there. I said, I told my wife that I hadn't even wrote a book yet. You know what happened? The Lord spoke to him. Of course, he called Jan Crouch and the next thing you know, I'm flying with him to TBN to be interviewed. And he doesn't know anything. So on the jet, I told him, just so you know. He, and he just got, he got tears in the eye. He said, he said, you did it right. You went to your prayer closet with your wife, and you didn't talk to anybody about it. And he said, that's why you're here with me. And it started from there. But listen to me. When we got home, with it, we had so many calls for salvation that we had to actually get an, a 1-800 number for the calls, to take the calls for the salvations all over the world. It was only a 28-minute interview. And all I did was talk about Jesus. Can you imagine that? I didn't once talk about myself. And I lifted him up, and it drew all men to him. Can you imagine that? Okay, now listen to me. I had six books out at the time. They all sold out in an hour. And now I didn't even do it for that. And nobody could understand why. I go, well, I said, whatever is in you, you need to yield to it. And your gifts will make room for you. Because what, th listen to me. Take this to your car with you today. Here's how it's all rigged in your favor. God placed something in you that is unique. It's then what you don't know is he places a demand for that gift in you in people so then your value goes up you didn't get you didn't understand that it's, it's called the law of supply and demand now listen god rigs it in your favor by placing something in you that everyone else needs are you getting it oh i feel it okay so he placed something in me and then he sent me back and everybody needs what's in me, but it's not mine. I'm just carrying it. Okay, you got it? Okay, so I, I can't draw attention to myself because then, then I'm on my own. And I don't want that. Trust me, I've already done that. You know, I'm lucky to be alive on my own. Just like my, my flight instructor, he, was, he had 30,000 hours in airplanes. And he was a captain for our airline. But he, he, he said, you know, I told you yesterday, the Lord said, uh, to me, I'm supposed to give you all your ratings 
commercial pilot license and everything. And here's a car, and here's a place at my house. Here's the keys. And um, we did that in nine months. It was a three-year program. And one day when we were out training, it was really turbulent. And I'm fighting to keep that airplane, you know, on course. And he said, um, I got the airplane. Let go of the controls. And when I let go of the controls, he didn't take them. And it smoothed out. He goes, see, the airplane flies better without you. So take that to your car today. And I learned something. Because when I was, when I was in the presence of Jesus, you know, I, I had been to a school that taught me you got to work the word. That means you got to, like, quote the word. you got to work it. And then when I met Jesus, I realized, wait a minute, he's a person. He is the word. And he's working me. I'm not working him. You see how you can take the personality out of the person, and then all you have is a system. And so if you don't have your checklist in front of you, you feel like, but you know what? The checklist should be inside of you. Okay, you get it? Okay, enough about that. You want to talk about Noah's Ark, or what do you want to talk about? Okay, if you want to encounter the supernatural, just so you know you're encountering it right now. Because the word of God is being spoken under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus told me, he said, wherever the Spirit is, there's freedom. He said, so if there's not freedom in a room, there's no Spirit. And then he told me something's going to blow you away. He said, most church activity that they call Spirit is really soul. And that's why it goes away. He said, most, he wouldn't believe how much percentage it was. We call it Spirit, but it's soul. Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And listen, he who the Son sets free is free indeed, which is, means it's sealed. You're free. Okay, so Jesus told me, you tell the people, that where two or more gather, the reason why he is in the midst, he said, I am the notary republic. Whatever you agree on, I stamp it, and it's done. He notarizes it. That's why he's here today. He's here to, to stamp with approval and approve and expedite whatever we agree on. Oh, you all didn't get that because you'd be dancing right now. That's the absolute truth. If you look at the verses in any of the Gospels where this is mentioned, there is no asterisk beside that verse where you go down and say, an exception is if you're under three or you have a car that's a jalopy or what, you know, no, it's not, it's, there's no exclusive, there's nothing exclusive, exclusivity. There's nothing excluding that. You can, you can have that. Same thing with ask, seek, and knock. It says ask, ask, and you shall receive. There's no asterisk that you go down and say, except if, if you've been bad today. Or if you didn't tithe. He didn't mention anything about giving in there. He mentioned about receiving. Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door shall be open for you. Seek and you shall find. That's it. In any language, any skull, it would take a really good scholar to mess that up. Okay, but we, we skip over that because you know why? Because we don't experience it. But see, I've been sent here to this church to tell you the things that you're not experiencing, the things you need to hit really hard. Because Jesus said one thing to me. He said, you ought to take notice when I marveled. And there were two places where he marveled. They had great faith, but they weren't even in the covenant of Israel. They were Gentiles. But they said, if you'll just speak the word, it'll be done. The other lady says, even, even the children, or even the, the children or, or the dogs underneath the table, if they eat the crumbs off the master table, see, she had faith. She discerned who he was. Do you discern who he is this morning? Okay, the other thing the Lord, just to wrap all this up, the other thing the Lord asked me to talk to you about this morning is the fact that... He has nothing against you. Nothing. And he told, he told me, because I, I mean, I can't mess this up. I was, I, was, I was three feet from him. He said, there's no one up here in heaven hindering you, stopping you, talking against you, or limiting you. No one. 
He said, I've never limited you. Who told you you can't do that? And I got to thinking about it. Yeah, who did? I realized that I was waiting on God and he was waiting on me. Okay, so getting back to this room. He took me from the throne to this room down the hallway. And I'm in this room, and I told you there's no furniture, nothing. There's just glory. Now, what I, when I walked in there, I looked. Jesus was in there because he went in first. He turned around and looked at me to see my, you know, see my reaction. And I go, whoa, what is this room? Because it, it, it was like nothing I've ever felt before. And I was just at the throne. And I walked on the blue sapphire. It's in Exodus chapter 24, verse 10. For those of you who are waiting for scripture for everything I say, I have scripture for everything. Exodus 24.10, God brought his own platform down and stood on it in front of Israel. Because he said, I have a problem when I step and touch the earth. It, it starts quaking and breaking up. And when I speak, cedars split. He said, so I have to bring my own platform that can handle the holiness because the world is under a curse. So I bring my own platform. Well, that's in the throne room. Okay, so I'm on all of that, and then he takes me to this room, and I said, Jesus, what is this? He, he looked at me, he said, when you walked into this room, you walked into the middle of the Father's heart. I felt love like I have never felt before. I have, there's no rejection, there's no depression, there's no doubt, no fear. And then he said something to me that I don't want to tell you, because I've not said this before publicly but Jesus said don't wait for the next move of God because you are the next move of God yeah. what he said I'm moving in you and if you yield see Smith Wigglesworth he was asked Smith Wigglesworth asked why have you gone to five denominations he said well he said, I, I went to the denomination, each of them, because God was moving. He said, when God kept moving and they didn't, I found myself outside the denomination. So I found another place where God was moving. And when they stopped moving and God was still moving, I, I found myself outside that denomination. He said, it happened five times. He said, I just keep moving with God. And I find myself outside. <laughs> He also said, show me a man in wit's end corner with, you know, at the end of his rope, wit's end corner. And he said, now I'll show you a man that God can use. He said, God mowed me over until he got rid of me. Now, that's a man that used to change the diapers for his wife while she was preaching, Polly. What happened to the man who was changing the diapers, watching the kids while she would preach, that when she died and didn't, didn't say goodbye, that he pulled her out of the casket, threw her against the wall, and, and resurrected her. What happened to a man like that? I'm telling you. I just told you what happened. It's not about you. But the Holy Spirit is moving. And what we need to do is we need to fall upon the rock, lest the rock fall on us. We need to go to the cross. You see, he gave me... He, I don't have time to go through it, but he gave me the ingredients for this next move. He told me, he said, he said, Kevin, you go back and you let me move through you. But this is what he said. These are the ingredients. And he gave me the eight ingredients of this next move. And I'm going to tell you what. It's just like John the Baptist. He wouldn't get on Christian TV because he had his sermon was only three seconds long. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Are you kidding me? Do you have anything nice to say? That's what they would say. Because we need, we need 28, 31. We need 28 minutes and 31 seconds. And we need you to say something nice. Well, that's all I got. You want me to pray some more? Okay. Yeah, it's still repent. <laughs> now, listen to me. I'm, I'm, I'm helping you here. You have no idea how much I'm helping you. Because listen to this. Jesus, he said, Kevin, why did the Father give me 40 days of ministry after I died? I go, I don't know. Because <laughs> I always wondered that. There's no CD set for those 40 days of what he did, you know? Think about it. Wouldn't you like to have that? So he asked me this. 
He said, well, Kevin, if you were given an extra 40 days of ministry, what would you preach on? I go, okay, now I'm tracking with you. So I looked it up. He preached on the kingdom of God. It says it right in the book of Acts. In the first chapter, it says, he preached on the kingdom of God for 40 days. So he had 40 extra days as a gift. Is everybody here? You know, you know he, he, was, he, was, he was walking around for 40 days. Did you, you know that, right? Okay. Did you know there was a lot of people that were resurrected, and they went back home? But all the people in the world say, oh, you know, that really didn't happen. He, he, you know, he, didn't, he wasn't resurrected. Well, you tell those people that got raised from the dead. What about all the people like the Josephus and all those people that actually listened, that had the rec- what that he was teaching and walking around after the resurrection? So I said, okay, why did, you, did the Father give you 40 days more? He said he was paying me back for the 40 days of temptation in the desert. He said, you go back and tell the people that for every harassment day that the devil gives to you, you get a day of ministry under the power of the Spirit. And I said, okay, while we're on it, how about this fig tree thing? Why were you mad that day? What's with the fig tree? You ever wonder about that? So this is what he said. Well, he said, Kevin, when Adam and Eve ate, he said, and they, they looked down and they're naked. He said, what was the first thing you would do? I would grab whatever was closest to me. He said, it was the fig. It was a fig tree. Is everybody still here? Okay, so you know they covered themselves with fig leaves, right? Okay. Well, I said, yeah, but why are you picking on that? Why are you picking on the fig tree? He said, because that was man's solution to sin. And I hate religion. (laughs) And he went on from there. He said, those figs, he told me, I don't know, I've never been to Israel. I'm going, we're, we're taking a group with Sid Roth in April, but I've never been there. But listen to me. He told me that fig tree will always have figs on it because even if it's not the season, he said they, there's so many of them and they, had, they sat on there and dried and then they were really good. And so you could always pick from them between the seasons. He said that one had none on it. And he said that's what religion has, no fruit. And so he cursed it. He cursed the, the man's system because it had no fruit. Isn't that good? And it just went on from there. He kept explaining things to me. I, I, I was, he said, what? He said, why? Um, he said, ask me why I had to, to tell John to write to the seven pastors of the seven churches. And I'm like, look, I'm like, just tell me. Because uh, me and my wife were, were, were in our bedroom, and he walked right in. And he goes, I need to talk to you for a minute. And I looked at her, and he said, no, just you. And I said, honey, Jesus is here. I got to go to the office. So he was in my office. And he goes, ask me about, you know, he asked me, asked me about that. I go, okay. And he said, ask me. So I had to ask him. And he said, because the pastors weren't listening to me. And I had to write through John to them. Yeah. Which means that's New Testament. That means that we can, we can not listen to God. And he, he said that the lukewarm got spit out. That's in the age of grace. We're in a, you know, we're in the in a, the grace now. You know, God loves me. <laughs> and he told in the age of grace, in the New Testament, in red, that if you are neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit spit you out. Okay. Now while we're on it, Peter, one of the best pastors, said to two people in his congregation, "You lied to the Holy Ghost. Bye bye." Now, that's a pastor of love. The husband died, and then a time after that, Sapphira comes in. He doesn't help her, doesn't coach her. It was almost 5,000 people in that church. Nobody Facebooked her or warned her to get her story right. She didn't even know her husband was dead. Now, this is the age of grace and love. God loves me. He understands me. Will you tell that to Ananias and Sapphira? Okay, all right, we'll talk about, let's talk about Noah's Ark. 
I'm, just, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm doing this like, you know, I just want to tell you some things. Is there's going to have to become correction here. Now, the things that Jesus told me are the ingredients are things that are not very popular. So as a test, I said, Lord, these, he gave me the eight subjects. I made CDs of every one of them. And I put them out and I said, I'm going to see how many hits they get on YouTube. And they got nothing, like nothing. Like repentance, holy altars of God, brokenness and humility. 300 views versus like 15,000 for receiving from heaven. <laughs> but you can't receive from heaven unless you, you hear what I'm saying through the Spirit here. Now listen to me. That's what I did for a test. I was, when the lights went out, I was about to tell you some things yesterday. And, the, and Satan prevented me from doing that. But oh, I'll tell you that now. What I was telling you was I used to go to these Iranian churches that escaped, escaped Iran through Canada. And we would go up there and minister to these people. And I told you about how they would come and say, well, you know, I want to go back and get my parents. Will you pray for me? They only been saved a month. They weren't asking me for money. They weren't asking God for money. They weren't asking me for anything. They were asking that, that God, you, I would pray for an angel to go with them to get their parents out. They were going to wait at the Turkey border. And it touched me. And I realized, I realized that some people really understand what's important. And I wanted to know how some people get there and some people don't. I always wanted to know that. And what I found out is it has to do with a broken heart. It has to do with a humble spirit. It has to do with positioning yourself in a place of need and not in a place of abundance. Jesus said this, listen. He said to the, one of the churches, I, I don't know, I think it was a Laodicean church. He said, he said, you say you're rich. You need nothing. You say you can see. <laughs> he says, the truth is you're naked, you know, well clothed. He said, you're, you're naked. You need salve to see. You're blind. You're poor. And he said, but if you ask of me, I'll give you gold tried in the fire. I'll give you I salve. And I'll clothe you in a robe of righteousness. You see, this is New Testament in grace, love. <laughs> Do you get it? Every single time that Jesus told John to write, this is what he'd say. He who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. Will you agree with me that the Spirit's saying these things to us right now? So I have to humble myself in the sight of God. I have to realize that I am not all I think I am, but I am exactly what God says I am. I don't think anymore. So what happened was with Two days later, after I was on TBN, after being on that high of, of watching me, I'm a nobody. I was a I was assistant pastor in churches, and they never knew that I'd gone to heaven. I served pastors where I was there all the time on our days off, Kathy and I, and I taught a Sunday school. I didn't even touch the pulpit. And God took me from that servant place, and he's put me in a place where I'm still serving you and not getting excited about this. Because I learned to serve people that didn't want me to serve them. I learned, to be, I learned how to, to be loved by heaven when everyone hated me. When I wasn't known, I didn't stick up for myself. I didn't push myself forward. I went to God. That's what David did versus what Saul did. David ran to God. 
Saul did it on his own, and he lost the kingdom. Okay? So you have to get to this place. Do it quickly this morning. The eight ingredients that Jesus gave me, they're powerful. But they have to do with going back to the basics. The words that are powerful. The crucified life. It got like 300 hits when I put it on. And yet Jesus clearly said in my Bible and yours that if you want to be any part of me, you got to pick up your cross, and deny yourself, follow me. Now, now, he said that before he died on a cross. He told the disciples and the people that before he died. Okay. So I wrote on Facebook. I said, I just want everyone to know that I am a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and that it would be a privilege for me to die for Jesus Christ. That's all I wrote. I had three likes. One was me, and the other two were Muslims from those churches in Canada who had converted from Islam. They hearted me. Okay, you hear me? I couldn't believe it. Because I was told once I did those TV programs, congratulations, there's money on your head in Iran. You can never go to Iran. That's what I was told. And I thought, I'm ministering, you know, it's just like the glory, you know, the glory. I get to minister to people all over the world. And then the pastor put his hand on me, congratulations. There's money on your head now. Their picture is, is in the government of Iran right now. And then all of a sudden, listen to me, the price, the price for doing what I'm doing comes forward. Okay, so then the Lord told me, he said, take a picture of Bambi. Now, I'm not kidding you. I found a little baby deer in the grass, and I put, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and I put that on Facebook, and it went viral. Bambi. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of likes. I went back to the other one, still just three. Now, listen to me. I met him. He's worth it. He's worth everything that you give him. Everybody stand. Here's what I want to announce. I have, the Holy Spirit has been allowed to do surgery on you. Now I want to announce something to you. The joy of the Lord is coming back to the church. It's the new wine. Jesus told me. Now, well, listen to me. Will everybody promise if you're not, just to listen to me right here. Jesus told me, he said, the last move will be like the first move. The last miracle that you encounter on this earth, he said, will be the first miracle that I did. So I hurried up and went, and I found it in John. He turned water into wine. He said, I've saved the best for last. There's wine being poured out on the body, the new wine. It's the joy of the Lord. It's so close right now. There'll be services where, I mean, it happens in other countries all the time. I never get to preach. Whole rows just fall out. When I get up here and talk like Mr. Rogers, whole rows fall out. People laugh for two hours, and I can't get a word in. And I just want to preach. What's going on? Because they've already had their fill of religion. There's, they're done. They're done with man's way, the fig leaf. And you all are done. So you have to participate in the powers of the coming age that talks about in Hebrews. Now listen to me. The Lord's moving right now. Right now. There is so much freedom in this room if you'll just let your spirit be permeated with the, with the presence of heaven right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, do your work. Extend your hand and perform miracles because your word has been spoken and signs and wonders follow your word. The preaching of the word. 
Heal the people right now. Touch all the people with the power. Oh, boy. Thank you, Father. Touch. Hands-free ministry here. Power is present at all times. And the Spirit of God is setting you free. You are free indeed. In the name of Jesus. The Spirit says those doors that will not open, they are commanded now from heaven to open. And the glory of the Lord shall come in. Those things that are pending shall be delivered. In the name of Jesus. No more delay. I break the powers. In Jesus' name. Exceedingly above all you can ask or think will be given unto you. Pressed down. Shaken together. Shall men give unto your bosom. You are set free. You are forgiven. And the fire of God will start to permeate this place. And the fire of God will cause all chaff to be burned up. You are going to see days of heaven on earth. Days of refreshing are coming from the throne of God to you because you have been faithful. You have stayed in there and kept your testimony of me. And now your reward is with me as I come and visit you. And I will not only visit, but I will inhabit. I will get to the place where I will stay permanently because you've accepted this move of God. In the name of Jesus. There is all kinds of internal organs being healed right now. I release the healing. The angels that see the face of your Father in heaven are with you. They have not left you. It's time for justice. It's time for recompense. It's time for the word of the Lord to come forth from this place in a greater matter to where people come because they want to hear what God is saying. They come because the doctors have given up on them, but Jesus has not. It's coming. The word of the Lord has been sent to this place and he heals you of all your diseases. In the name of Jesus, let's worship.